by several participants who went on the tour. And we think it's very interesting. But we want uh, this part of the program to be over by 7 o'clock because the second half of the program is going to bring us up to date on what's happening with the children right now that are at the border, both um, in Artesia and also in some other locations that are probably safer places. This part will be uh, uh, presented by people who have been to the detention centers or have worked with the children very recently. So it's going to be of interest to all of us, including me. So, we, so we're not going to take questions until the end because we want to make sure that we have time for that uh, very important second part of the program. Um, if you don't get your questions answered, please write them down. Come up and talk to us afterwards or maybe we'll have time at the end of the program. So we, had, uh, we went on this uh, border immersion trip to uh, Cristo Rey. This is the outside of the um, Lutheran Church in El Paso. It was founded in 1992 and I believe it was founded by uh, the current pastor, Pastor Guzman. Um, and she says it emphasizes learning from the poor. This organization provides guided tours for people who want to learn more about the border. And not, not every tour is the same. So we're going to show you our tour, but the next tour might be a completely, I mean, it won't be completely different, but it might be very different from this one. Pastor, a pastor Guzman is originally from Bolivia. She is a very joyful Christian woman. And Gretchen is from Connecticut. She's the after school coordinator, and she's also the immersion tour coordinator. She was our driver and our guide. And we were very impressed with the quality of all the volunteers that we met who are serving immigrants. But these two were uh, just very special people. Um, Cristo Ray provided us with very comfortable bunk beds, um, with clean bathrooms and a kitchen, very clean kitchen. And we sometimes cooked and washed our own dishes. And we also had this conference room, which is also the after school room. We had a very comfortable van to travel into, travel around with, and they introduced us to many people who told us their stories. So it was a wonderful experience. It's also, Cristo Rey is also a Lutheran church with a membership made up of immigrants and others whose average income is like ten to $15,000 a year. When uh, Pastor Guzman says $17,000 is barely enough. So the church provides them with many benefits. They are proud that 18 kids who have passed through the program have graduated from college. The border immersion was emotionally, physically, and spiritually very hard. I myself took a nap every time I got a chance. <laughs> so we were happy for any comic relief, such as this mother and daughter, Gabby and Lily who were constant, not constantly, but very frequently were helping us to smile. I, I want to make a comment. Um, um, I'm an immigrant myself. I'm from Guadalajara, Mexico. And um, I wanted to take this trip because I wanted to learn a little bit more about the coalition. I'm a new member of the coalition of New Mexico. Yes. Coalition. New Mexico Faith Coalition for Immigrant Justice. So I really wanted to work and I really wanted to learn more about the immersion uh, on the trip. So for me it was incredible. I go to Mexico once a year, maybe. Um, all my family live there. I live here, uh, me and my daughter here in town. And uh, it was extremely um, uh, hard to see how the families live there. And, and the conditions that they live. Um, I mean, I, that's my people, and I never, I mean, this was so impressive that I think everybody should have the opportunity to really uh, feel, you almost feel what they're feeling when they come close to the, to the, board, to the uh, fence and talk to you. And, and you see this uh, almost like um, they're hungry to come over to the country because they, you know, because of the circumstances that they're living from, at, you know, in, in, in Juarez. And some of them are not from Mexico, 
we also met a family that was from um, El Salvador and they told us their story. And these people from El Salvador actually cannot even work in Mexico because they don't have a work permit. So they, they, they go through, I mean, the stories that they told us, they were extremely touching to us. And, um, and it was really difficult to deal with the pain, you know, and then the, the impact that had on us. So we tried, when we had time, we tried to be funny and laugh and make people laugh. And they, they made fun of me a lot because of my accent and, and um, Starbucks, because I was saying Bug Stars instead of Starbucks. Um, so, you know, uh, it, was, it, was, it, it was an amazing trip. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so, we're, so speaking of the wall, um, this is what we call the wall, the Border Patrol calls it the fence. Uh, as you can see, it looks like it goes on forever. And as we walked up to it, these children came to visit, to uh, talk to us through, through the wall, and it was, uh, it was very emotional. They were neighborhood children. Here. Margie here is talking to some students. I just, I would just wanted to comment that I think for me, one of the profound um, and heartfelt experiences was reaching through the wire of that fence to touch their fingers. And uh, the pastor led us in prayer there. Um, but it, it's very difficult to accept because these are human beings, they're children. Okay, so we were we were there to um, also meet with the border patrol, and this is Ricardo Ricardo Baragan, who is the public relations guy, and he is really very good at his job. I mean, he had he had uh, I'm sure a script, and he he pretty much stuck to that. Uh, he didn't take very many questions from us. But we got some information. There are 20 sectors on the border. This is the El Paso sector, which is 286 miles long and includes West Texas and New Mexico. There are 2,600 agents in this sector, including some that come into the interior of Texas and New Mexico. There are 22,000 border agents and, and all along the, the uh, entire border. And he considers this way too few. Fewer than the state of New York, he says. Most efforts are within 100 miles of the border. So border and border agents in this sector must speak Spanish. He says, the fence, and it's a fence, not a wall, slows people down and, we can, and it usually only takes us 15 or 20 seconds to arrest a person in the city. In the rural areas, it is a vehicle bearer, barrier to smugglers, and he says that drug smugglers have moved out after the fences, electricity, and roads built. He also claimed that there are now fewer women being kidnapped and murdered than before in this sector. You know, I, I feel like uh, we can read about immigration, right, uh, on the internet and in the media, but for me personally, it was really impactful to go in person and and actually speak to Border Patrol face-to-face -face at the border, not in their office, but at the border, and this particular immersion trip arranges that, that you get to ask questions of Border Patrol at the border, and um, I remember asking, well, how many immigrants have you shot at the border. How many people got killed? How many got killed? And he's like, well, we don't track that. We track how many Border Patrol have been killed. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> We're like talking past each other big time. But um, so for, for me, it was, um, it was just a, a great experience to be face to face with, with people that I've read about. And, and, and I highly recommend, if you're considering going on a border immersion trip for a weekend, I highly, highly recommend it. All right. So he says we can detain someone if we have 
reason, we send them to a judge for deportation or to ICE for investigation. So, and I also like their direct quotations. Here's, an, here's what he said, the Border Patrol is like cops on the beat. We don't operate with discretion. We don't know what happens to people after we arrest them. We're just doing our job. It's not a wall, it's a fence that slows people down. So there's the Border Patrol side of it. Now we're gonna go on, because another reason we went to the wall was to speak to Elsa. Elsa, it's kind of hard to get Elsa's story. We are talking about stories here because we're talking to her through the fence, through the wall. It was outside and I didn't hear or understand everything that she said, so please help me, panel. Um, she came on the train from El Salvador. She was pregnant and she left El Salvador because it was very dangerous because of the gangs. She and her husband lived in the U.S. for a while and they attended Cristo Rey Church. However, her husband, a Mexican, has been deported three times. So if he's caught again entering the United States, he will go to prison for years. Since he can't come back, the whole family went back to Juarez to be with him. She says, there are good people and bad people in the Border Patrol. She cannot go to the hospital in Mexico because she's not a Mexican. So she goes to hospitals in the United States. This means coming across the border and risking getting caught, and she has done this twice. Once she had a miscarriage in an American hospital, and that time she was treated very badly. There was, there was no DNC after the uh, miscarriage, and no clean, they wouldn't give her any clean clothing. She lost the baby, and they threatened to take the other two children from her because they are American citizens. Pastor Guzman was taking care of the children, but in the end, the Border Patrol took her to the bridge and gave her money to go back to Mexico where she went to a shelter. When she was pregnant with the last baby, this little girl, she did not realize that her water had broken when they were trying to cross at Santa Teresa in New Mexico. Someone was supposed to meet them with a car at the border, but they didn't come. So she and her husband, the whole family, had to walk a long way. And she was taken to a hospital. The baby survived. Her husband was detained this time and sent back to Mexico again. All of the, all of the girls, eight, six, and one, were born in the United States, so they are citizens. The father has a job in Juarez now. He makes $5 a day, which is not enough to live on. And they pay $50 a month for rent. Food is almost the same price in Juarez as in the United States. So Cristo Rey still helps them, although they are on the other side of the border. She says, if they stop the deportations, we'll try and cross again. We hope the oldest child will be able to cross every day and study in the United States. Education is not free in Mexico. So the next stop is Angelia's story. Um, this is a beautiful picture, but really it wasn't a beautiful spot. I don't know if the film makes it look beautiful, but her house is in a very dry, dusty, remote location in New Mexico. We drove for about an hour from El Paso to get there. And this is a colonia, an informal community. There are 325 colonias in Mexico and 2,500 colonias along the border on both sides. Many people, these are sort of like in, you know, not established communities, just places that people have made, built houses. Many people were sold land in the desert for $1,500. They, they were told that there would be electricity, water, and sewer, but often these things never happened. Now this is against the law. Angelia's house first didn't have electricity or water. Now she has some electricity and water to bathe in, but she still must buy drinking water for $50 to $100 a month. She does not appear to have any close neighbors. Since she was a little girl, she passed back and forth between the United States and Mexico. So this is, this is her story. Um, 
she began to take religious ideas from the United States back to Mexico. And around 2003, she and her husband decided to get a crossing visa. With this, she could only stay for 72 hours. To get one, you have to have a house, money in the bank, and have a family in Mexico so that it's sure that you're going to return. Uh, it only allows you to shop, visit relatives, and not to work or stay. So they overstayed their visas, and they came with their three kids. Two of the kids are U.S. citizens. A good example of how families are split up like this. Some are citizens, some are not. A year or two later, her husband's mother became ill and her husband returned to see his mother. At the border, they asked him for his wallet and they saw that he had a Texas ID, proof that he was living there in El Paso. They really are not allowed uh, uh, to see his personal papers, but he didn't know that. So her husband called the pastor at Cristo Rey from Mexico to deliver the news to her wife, to his wife. He was deported and could not come back. Angelia thought, what shall I do? Should we go to Mexico or should we stay here? The third child had a heart condition that needed to be treated here. So the husband tried to cross back. He was apprehended again and went to jail for 25 days. This was very hard for him because he is, a, she says, because he is a very good man and never had been in jail before. So she decided to stay here and take care of the kids. She had no income. She learned how to make tamales and she sells them to neighbors, immersion groups, family and friends. Sometimes her husband would send money. She was very scared because the house was in a very bad condition with a lot of holes and no electricity at the time. She was afraid, especially at night, because of the rattlesnakes. Her husband was trying to save money to hire a coyote to bring him back, but this would cost a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars with half of that up front. Angelia met Conchita, a health promoter. A federal grant pays for the health promoters. Conchita uses Cristo Rey as an office. This is how Angelia has met many wonderful people who have helped her. One group fixed the roof and painted the house. She said this made her feel much better. She went to the wall to, t to see her husband in January of this year. The Border Patrol prohibits people going to the wall, and the Border Patrol were looking at them through binoculars. So they were intimidated. But Angelia stayed back until finally a whole group went up to the wall, and she was able to approach and touch his hand. In February this year, her husband came back. A coyote was supposed to bring him, but abandoned him at the top of the mountain. He said he was going to get blankets. Her husband decided to leave it up to God, and he was finally able to get across. Angelia was speaking at church when he walked in, and uh, it was a big surprise. And uh, the reunion was very joyful and dramatic. So now, there. this is her yard. I think it's so interesting that she is trying to plant and water and make her, her, you know, her, her place more beautiful. Um, now they're trying to keep a low profile because her husband, of course, does not want to get picked up again. So she takes him to work in the car. And they said having a car is huge. The children go to school on a bus. She's very happy about that. She thanks God for taking care of them. That's, that's us in front of her house. And she is constant, she's very religious. She says, God sent people to take care of us. Don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big God is. <laughs> I thank God for taking care of us, for all we have learned, for getting us through all these problems, because we still have our health and our marriage. So that was very heart rendering, of course. Okay, the next, the, you want any comments on that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I think now would be a good time to, to just observe that um, this, this very moving weekend that we participated on, and it was such a privilege, um, you'd hear, at one moment, you'd hear a story that was so depressing 
Um, and on the other hand, it was so inspiring to see this woman. She hardly had anything. She's trying to raise a family in the middle of nowhere, and she had so much dignity, you know, and it was, I mean, I could get choked up just remembering. I mean, she was so, so inspirational. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's all I want to say. The other thing that she shared, is it working? Okay. Um, the other thing that she shared is that she had no skills in terms of uh, being able to seek employment. And uh, she was in, in contact with someone that taught her how to make tamales. So she used this as a means for providing some income to her and her family. And the day that we were there, we were uh, honored to be able to eat some of her delicious tamales. And um, she acknowledged the, the difficulty in just learning um, how, to, how to prepare them, but uh, they were wonderful. They were so hot. <laughs> they were yeah. great. All right, so moving on to Annunciation House in El Paso. It was started 35 years ago by Ruben Garcia and five others. Now there are three houses. This house is for short-term residents and asylum seekers. In the 70s and 80s, it was mostly people from Central America. Now it is mostly Mexicans who stay there. 30 to 7 people uh, can stay there at any time. Ruben Garcia adopted three kids from El Salvador, and one of them painted this mural. Um, the Annunciation House is open 24-7. People hear about it through word of mouth. Even ICE brings people here, people with children, pregnant women, and people who are sick. Um, they have a pretty good relationship with INS. The project runs on donations. Even all the food is donated, and the guests cook it and clean up. Only donations that come with no strings attached are accepted. Most people come, most of the uh, guests come with nothing, and most are economic immigrants. There are eight volunteers who live on the premises. They make a one-year commitment, and they are on duty 24 hours, but they have a, a little volunteer room that they can re retire to, if I guess, if they get tired. They get one day off a week, and a week off every three months. This volunteer from Colorado says, I am learning the flame that feeds my passion. She had just graduated from college and it was just so inspirational to see her there. Um, she says, the closer you are to the poor, the closer you are to God. And people are so much better than their worst act. So she was very inspirational too. Um, Here's some scenes from the Annunciation uh, House, the laundry room, the uh, place where they hang the, up on top of the house. Um, here's the bulletin board where they can get information. They can get clothing and shoes. The basement is huge and it's full of stuff. Um, there's one particular section that's housewares for people who graduate and go on and you know get their own homes so and it also has relationships with other nonprofits in town and they refer people for therapy and legal services it's basically Catholic but there are no requirements mother Teresa came here she was the one that called it the house of the Annunciation and these are art is a, a work of art that's there. It shows some of the shoes of the migrants. And then we have a little, I don't know if you call this comic relief, but it is Gabi in front of the Virgin of Guadalupe. I thought it was pretty nice. <laughs> and, 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 and you know what? I, I wanted to mention that um, in the picture before um, where with Argelia, it, this trip was very touching, very inspiring. Um, like some of us got really inspired by the trip, like myself and my daughter on the other hand, she had a really hard time. Um, when we came back, she cried, like I don't know for how many nights because of the pain, you know, that she saw the families, how they live. And, and on the other hand, for me it was very inspiring. Argelia, I'm a single mom and I raised my daughter uh, by myself and I was always scared, you know, of people breaking into my house or people stole my car or 
you name it. And when Argelia was telling the story about her living with the three children at home, and she said that when she would drive home at night, she would leave the lights on the car on because there were so many snakes. So the snakes will run away and she would get a stick and wait for the children to get into the house, turn off the lights of the car and run inside the house. I mean, the stories, you know, how, how people are surviving and, and she's so brave and she's so happy and she's so Thank grateful, you. grateful for what she has. I mean, her house was spotless. You know, uh, the bathroom was so extremely clean, cleaner than my house, uh, and, and no water, because there's no water. You know, th at this place, and the, the young kids were so inspiring to us, because we're older. We, we, we care for our brothers and sisters, but to see these children, 20 years old, 23 years old, giving up one, two years of their life to be uh, to be volunteers. I mean, that is so amazingly, I mean, that's like, wow. It, it, you know, we have, we have a future. We're gonna make it. We have great kids. Exactly. Okay, so moving, oh, there's one more picture from an Annunciation House. Actually, this was 12 years ago. This was a young man that was actually uh, um, shot by the border patrol not maybe not the border patrol but yeah I think it was border patrol but anyway it was that was the last incident that they've had like that so they have a pretty good relationship now um, okay moving on this was the van that we used we're going to Juarez Mexico and the, the van that belongs to the Iglesia Luterano and um, it was very comfortable. And, you know, we had our happy moments. <laughs> but as soon as we got to the Colonia Anapra in Juarez, which is built on a former dump, things became very sad. People come here from all over Mexico. Some are waiting, hoping to cross the border. Others are just trying to get by. There's a lot of tension and fear every day. So we're just showing you some scenes from the uh, neighborhood. There was a dog that was dying. Of course, we Americans are so attached to our dogs. This was very sad to see. And, but we can think that people who don't have a lot of money. You know, they're going to take care of their children, and the dogs are probably just going to have to take care of themselves. So this was just another indication of the poverty here. However, this is my favorite photograph <laughs> of the whole trip, because in the midst of all this poverty, there is somebody who's really interested in taking care of the neighborhood. This is the local neighborhood watch. I mean, no matter how little you have, you want to keep it safe. And this is a brave thing to do in a neighborhood like that because the cartels and a lot of people with guns are very vicious and it's, it's just brave to, to pretend that you have some pride, I think. Anyway, we also found this other wonderful place. It's the library. It's run by Estella and Berta. And it's connected with a mission house, which has workshops for crafts, uh, for crafts to sell. It has youth workshops, it has guitar, computer classes, catechism classes. The library is important because it's a safe place for the children to be after school and on Saturdays. And the librarians help them with their homework. They listen to them read and they read to them and they help them with comprehension of what they read. They're real teachers. The kids don't waste their time here. It's also a very cheerful place. The kids we saw there seemed very happy to be there. 
I think this one's working. <laughs> um, the other thing about the library is that a lot of the parents participate with the children. Uh, that Saturday that we were there, we arrived about an hour before the library was officially open, and there were a lot of children and their families waiting outside. So there's a real hunger for knowledge, and the books that they have there have been received through donations only, and they're really trying to, um, to build their collection. Um, for uses for the for the children and the and their parents as well. It was very very inspirational to see what these two ladies have done to try to bring more education to the children. They have no place to play in the streets. I mean the streets are so rough. There are no basketball courts, no you know no facilities for them to have leisure. So this is a a light for them in terms of uh, learning and and being together in their community. Yeah, I was just going to say that that it was. Uh in such a dismal neighborhood, it was such a place of light and hope. Mm -hmm. um, it was very colorful, and um, you could tell that they saw that it was a key to a better future, really. I like this picture that's up here right now because it shows Mexico, and the United States has an igloo in it. <laughs> <laughs> but these are things you can get at the library, of course. <laughs> And here we are looking at the books. And the books are very well uh, selected and organized. They are not a bunch of just random books. But they, they always um, ask their donors. They have a list of books that they want. And they only take those books so they don't end up, because it's a very small library, they don't want to end up with a bunch of books that are really not useful. So. I I grew up in a big city. I grew up in Guadalajara, like I told you, and I remember going to the library. And um, the library that we used to visit, we were not able to take books home. We were just, it was like a resource kind of a library where you go and get all the information and then go home and, and write it down, write your paper. So for me, this was so amazing. I mean, I, I, I worked for, with families for, for 25 years in, in APS. And um, for me to see a library in Mexico, in that neighborhood, was like, wow, just blow my head away, you know. And, and to see the mothers reading to the children, because the mother was there with the child every Saturday reading. It was amazing. The books, like, like Joan said, were not just simple books. I mean, they were the books that we had at APS, you know, for the parents to read or for the children to read. This is Estella here in the pink. She grew up in California, so she speaks Spanish and English fluently, and she's obviously a very smart woman. The books, like we said, they're very carefully chosen. And her story is that she has five children and five grandchildren. Her kids are grown, so she can do this work. Two of her sons work in the maquiadoras, 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. They make cell phones for Chinese and American companies, ADC and Verizon. The cell phones are assembled in the United States and therefore they can be marked made in the USA. Both sons have gone to the university and another one is two semesters from a degree in psychology. She says that they always work an extra hour. The older one who has four years experience makes 900 pesos or $78 a week. The younger one makes 650 pesos or $60 a week. Estella says, in Mexico, education is not free. Nothing is free. Tuition, books, uniforms, um, transportation, registration, everything costs money. An elementary child needs $50 for school supplies, two uniforms, and two pairs of shoes. Special classes in high school cost extra, and it costs $30 to register for high school, and then $35 a month. They have to pay for even for their diplomas. College tuition is $365 a year, plus computer use, transportation, diplomas, etc. So churches in the United States sponsor uh, 64 children, donating $100 per ch elementary child, $200 for high school tuition and transportation for the college students. And this was an interesting comment on violence. There is a little less violence than before, but women are still disappearing. The press, the press just doesn't report it anymore, she says. We don't think about the future. 
And here they are, the fifth graders arrived while we were there. And this was a Saturday. And the teachers, some of their teachers came with them and it was just so joyful. We all just had such a wonderful time and they all wanted to be in the picture. It was <laughs> obvious they were very happy to be there. This is another happy spot in a very dismal neighborhood. This is the Anapra Cristo Rey Clinic. Dr. Mendoza is a woman who is a Methodist missionary working in Anapra as a doctor. She runs the clinic. She lives on the U.S. side of the border and drives across every day. Her husband is a professor at New Mexico State University. The clinic is associated with a refugee center in a nearby old folks home. She was originally from Chihuahua, the child of a minor became educated and was caused, called to be a medical doctor. She worked for Seguro Social as an emergency doctor. And then she moved to the dump in an opera to work with the poor. The clinic provides medical care and promotes education. Um, they have a scholarship program. What? Oh yeah, this is of course her, the doctor. And um, she has medicines, but they, uh, all the medicines are donated. And all the medical instruments are things that have been discarded from US uh, clinics. She, um, she also was commenting, commenting about, the, uh, about the violence. She says the violence is not stopping as much as, as it is moving, moving south. A Lutheran church tried to do some home improvement, but materials were often stolen, and the land they bought was confiscated by the cartels. It's too dangerous to build here. Big landlords control business on the border, she says. As for political parties, she says the PRI has more experience with making deals with the cartels on ceasefires. Um, the cartels don't bother us, she says, because we only make $5 a day in the clinic. She, she doesn't make anything at all. She's a volunteer. I told them they could have that $5 a day. The young, but um, So she keep, that's how they keep a low profile. They just don't make any money. The young women are still being killed and disappeared, she said. It's not gotten any better. It's just that the press has been silenced. Violence against women continues. The same oligarchy is in power. What they need is partnerships with churches, doctors, health clinics, student tuition donors, money so we can pay volunteer salaries equal to the Macchiadotta work. It's hard to communicate this with a PowerPoint. I mean, Joanne's done a fantastic job. She took, she must know shorthand. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of detail she has. But uh, this woman, Dr. Mendoza, is such a, a figure of courage. It was so humbling to be in her presence. We first met her because she came to the, the Lutheran church where we were staying and, we, and she told us her story. Um, and we were already impressed just by hearing her story, right? By her courage to take on really violent people. <laughs> and uh, she's not, she's not going to be moved. I mean, she's staying there. Mm -hmm. She's got f legs, you know, I, I, it's really hard to put into words, but she's, it was just humbling how courageous she is. And then to see her clinic, mm -hmm. um, it was very, very moving. Mm -hmm. Here are some of her prices, which are for a, for a um, consulto, 30 pesos is like $2.50. And I'm sure if somebody can't afford these things, they don't, they probably don't have to pay. So the prices are kept very, very low and uh, she does whatever she can do. And if she runs across somebody that has a problem like um, a leg amputated or something, she searches for people that can provide prostheses and things like that from the United States or from other places. Oh, and she also, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is the, it's like a five room building and one part of it is a dental section. Um, 
And here she is again, and she's a very cheerful person. I mean, to me, she's like Mother Teresa. I mean, she's we, were, we just admired her so she's much. She's tall, small in, small in stature, but gigantic yeah. heart. Just yeah, awesome just amazing heart. person. And she says, cartels have been known to, to machine gun school buses. Of course, they want to keep everybody scared to death. And one day, she said, the kids came from the school, which is only a block away, and said all the te teachers were down on their knees. Um, and people with guns were making them sign papers saying that they would give them part of their salary. And teachers in Mexico do not make much money, so they, the cartels are pretty hard up asking for part of their salary. But the police arrived too late because they're very corrupt, and that was probably arranged. Now, the last person we interviewed was, um, oh, here we go back across the border here. And this probably looks very familiar because we all used to do that all the time. And it still seems just as crowded and the same old bridge and everything. Can I mention something here? Yeah. Um, you may have heard how dangerous Juarez is, and you might be afraid to visit Juarez. And yet I, I always felt safe the entire time. I don't know about you all. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, I wouldn't have gone to these visits without being on a guided tour, you know, and that's why I felt so safe, I'm sure. But just to reassure you that it, we never, I never felt like I was no. in danger ever. No. So we're, we're, I'm just going to talk about this lawyer's story. He's the last person. Um, we talked to him the last night. We were there, we were all exhausted. Uh, but we tried to absorb. Sure we tried to absorb <laughs> the information that he gave us, and of course, um, immigration law is so complex. It is just like they say; it's worse than tax law. And we all know how bad that is. Um, but he was a, his father was a miner in Arizona, and in 1984, his father became a border patrol agent. He went. So the son, Danny went to law school because he wanted to do civil rights. He tries to get every relief possible for his clients. He worked first for the Diocese of Migrant and Refugee Services in El Paso, where he learned how to get the client's story. And he says, this is really hard to do. It takes time. You have to, to interview the people and find out everything about them and what they might, what they might qualify for to get some relief. You have to talk to them for at least half a day. So, um, so he learned how to do that. And he has been practicing for 10 years and now has his own practice. An interesting thing is that his father, the former Border Patrol agent, now works in his office. <laughs> there, he says, he explains some stuff, some very basic stuff that maybe you already know, but to me it was, um, and enlightening to know these things. That there are ways for Mexicans to get here legally, such as religious visa, certain occupations that are needed here, or extraordinary abilities. To get a visitor visa, you must have a house, a stable job, and money in the bank. A student visa is very expensive. And he pointed out that the 9-11 terrorists that were here were on student visas. He answered our questions about why people don't just apply and come here legally. If you have a legal family here, the spouse, parent, or children can petition for you, but the number of visas for people from Mexico is very limited. Spouses have the highest priority, but the system is broken for any other family member. Sons and daughters over 21 who applied in 1993 are now having their applications reviewed. That's 21 years ago. Those kids, however many years they were, are probably not still trying to get in the United States. There is a terrible backlog because there are not enough people to process the applications. We spend it on border security instead of trying to process applications. If you self disport deport, which uh, some of our politicians have recommended, and you have been here for more than one year, and you are here illegally, 
you will be deported and you will have to wait 10 years to reapply. In federal court, people are chained. If it is their first detention, it's a misdemeanor. The second time, two years in jail. The third time, even longer. Asylum cases are very unlikely to succeed, he said. Only 3% are successful. Working permits and, and getting citizenship papers is very expensive process and will cost thousands. Medical treatment, then he talked about the detention centers a little bit. He said medical treatment in the detention centers is very poor. People can be in them for three months to three years. Cheney Halliburton owns some of them. Otero One and Otero Two in New Mexico are owned by corporations, I believe Halliburton. And although this lawyer has not visited those places, he said that, the, that his clients tell him that they are among the worst of all of the detention centers. I, th I would like to go there, I mean, that's on my list. <laughs> there are special camps for children, and this was before we had all this publicity about the children, but he said along the border there are special camps for children. And they are very sad because the kids usually come looking for their parents and they are so disappointed. So there's a lot of crying and suffering in the children's camps. So we just want to show you some more pictures, just a very few from this side of the border. This was our last day. We went and looked at the wall from the U.S. side. We saw the Constantina, Constantina uh, wire and everything and on the other side this is kind of of this wall there's a kind of no man's land so if they even try to come to this point they're probably going to be picked up before they even get to this wall I've co yeah. comment time yes. um, at that wall the residential area is immediately there I mean it's just right by the wall and what phased me right beside um, where you see to the right here there's a park and for me to think that children are playing in a park and looking at this wall, the message that comes through is just pretty, pretty sad. It's very heavy. So we also were taken up to this uh, place that was called uh, Rim Road Drive where we, in El Paso, where we've heard that drug, drug lords live in luxury and safety. Um, on the, this side of the border. We don't know about this house. I'm not saying a drug lord lives there, <laughs> but <laughs> it was just a very fancy house that we saw, and we thought, well, if there are any drug lords around here, they probably live in that one. <laughs> but we, I don't want to say that. Um, the next place we went was to the day, the day Workers Center in El Paso, and I thought it was very interesting. We didn't take pictures of the people waiting to, for jobs because they were pretty miserable and we didn't really want to make them more miserable. So we just looked at the outside of the place and you can see that um, it is the Union of Agricultural Workers United Without Borders. And that there is a, a museum, an urban museum there. These two certainly look like they're from the Mexican Revolution, a little Trotskyite looking people to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that was, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Then finally we went to the mural at the, at the border crossing. And it, it's quite beautiful. Just show you these pictures quickly because they show what, um, you know, Mexicans do in the United States and how essential they are. For some reason, it has alligators or crocodiles. Does anybody know what that means? No. We would see that symbol quite a few places. I don't know what the heck that means. Okay. And here we are in front of the wall. And here is Gabby doing a <laughs> selfie. <And laughs> So we said, well, next time you should come with us and you can do a selfie at the mural too. <laughs> so is there anyone here on the panel that has any more comments they'd like to make? What about Mary Beth? Mary Beth? She joined us for the second yeah. half. Go ahead. 
I just want to say that the um, the process of of doing this um, this presentation has really been inspiring to me because I wasn't able to get to all of the places that the group went to, but I feel like I was very much a part of it, and I hope you feel the same way. And it is a very inspiring uh, to experience it with them. Thank you. I just want to say one more thing. If you are interested in, in future border immersion trips, please make sure that you sign the um, list back there when you came in and checked that you're, uh, you know, in the column that, you're, that you want to be informed about future border immersion trips because we do hope that there will be some in the future. I was just going to repeat that um, we follow immigration in the headlines, but this this trip really put a face on what you're reading about. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't look at, at these folks as the other anymore. You know, we were equals in a room. And it was just a human connection mm -hmm. that I appreciated about this trip. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to add, too, that um, all of the people that were on the trip, I think we're told 13, 13, 13 of us, and I just felt uh, just very, very impressed with the concern that my fellow travelers here had for the, for the um, purpose of our being there, for seeing the conditions that people were uh, facing, and also uh, returning with the commitment that they're gonna continue to do work, whatever they can in their own roles and in their own ways to try to make a difference. It was a wonderful group to be part of. The last thing I want to say is that uh, also this trip, um, it made us aware of what, what's going on in Juarez, but also um, in my case, and I think a lot of us were sharing the, the, the idea that we feel so grateful for all the things that we have. And, and I think this trip just made me a better person for just to experience, uh, to experience what they, you know, what they go through every single day. So if you have questions, uh, we hope you will save them until after the next par portion, and then you can come up and ask any of us, or you know, we'll take questions at that time. Because we have some very important people here who have been working with the children on the border, and we would like them, uh, they're gonna come up and take our place, and um, we will talk to you guys later. Go ahead and have a snack. It'll take us a few minutes to set up, and then um, we'll be going right on to uh, the current situation.